Hello. Welcome to the Riddock Art Gallery. Tonight we are sitting here with Georgia Button and we're going to talk a little bit about her work. But first, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country and acknowledge our Boendic people and pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Tonight, we are doing a little bit different kind of opening. Unfortunately, due to COVID restrictions, we're pivoted, which is the word of 2021 <laughs> and 2020, probably. Yes, that's, word. <laughs> that's right. And we're doing a live artist in conversation sharing with you all tonight. And Georgia came here to install the work. So I really wanted to sit down with her and talk about this work behind us, Petrichor. Welcome, Georgia. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for inviting me to your stunning gallery. You're very welcome. So, Petrichor, tell us a little bit about... I'm really interested in the name, actually. I know it means... It's a word that the CSIRO made up to describe the smell of rain after a long, dry period, which I think, you know, a lot of Mount Gambians would be very familiar with after recent events, but what does the word mean to you? Why did you choose it for this? Um, I think this is a little bit cringeworthy, but I have a list of words that I have stashed away on my computer notes as potential titles for future works. And any time I'm making a work, I just sort of cycle through them and see if any of them are appropriate. So Petrichor was one that I had stashed away. And I really like the word because the Australian CSIRO came up with the word. And it's the smell that comes out of the earth. It's not just the smell after mm. rain, it's the smell that comes out of the earth. And it's something to do with the oils that come out of the ground after a long dry period. But this work and much of my practice is uh, about reflecting on my experience of living on a rural property in the north of South Australia, the mid-north of South Australia as a child and revisiting that property as an adult now that I don't live there permanently. Um, and this work in particular was about the things that are really familiar um, and quite different to living in Adelaide and in quite urban spaces. And one of the things about going home and lots of people that are from the country or from regional and rural areas talk about this. You know, they talk about how many more stars you can see when you go home, when you leave Adelaide, you look up and there's no pollution, you can see all these stars. Um, or if you're from a dry area, the smell of um, the earth or the smell that fills the air after a, a really long period of no rain um, and then it rains. So to me, it was just lovely that a word exists and even though this work isn't about rain, it's about those ideas of mm. something that is really familiar and tied to a certain place or time or era. Yeah. Um, I find it the sensation of that moment when the smell comes out of the earth to be very evocative. Yeah. Somehow it's permanently nostalgic. I don't know why, but it is very much linked to feeling of being at home and of being maybe a child or, or connected historically to a place. And I, I also like how accessible that is and what a common experience that is. I had a, um, one of my old lecturers, the brilliant, brilliant Jack Cross recently passed away. And in one of his history lectures at, um, when I was at art school, he said, and I wrote it down at the time, nothing compares to the smell of rain on dust. And I hadn't come across the word petrichor yet, but he grew up in a rural area. And when he said that in class, it was, it was like someone just understood exactly. It was like he'd been at the farm with me. And yeah, I guess that's why I use the word because it's a very sensory word. And a lot of my work is very sensory and yeah, it's a pretty common experience. Yeah. And you can't hear it right now, but there's also a soundtrack that goes with the work. Yes. And there's <laughs> sort of various elements to it. Can you explain it a little bit? There are various elements. There's a nice way of 
putting out. There's dad yelling at ants and dogs barking and you can hear lots of Kelpies featuring the soundtrack and lots of wind um, and just, you know, various things happening. And in the domestic shots, you can kind of hear mum in the background walking. I don't think mum knows that she's in it, but she is. <laughs> um, but I'd been making works in my practice that were a little bit more... I don't want to say emotional, but we're a bit more intense and not kind of neutral. Um, and for this work, I wanted to take a more observational role because we've all, I made this work during um, the pandemic and we've all been in such a heightened state of emotions. And I kind of just wanted to make something that was, had, you know, nostalgic elements and sensory elements, but was more just appreciating what I have. Um, and what has been in the family and appreciating things and observing things rather than, you know, unpacking that kind of deeper stuff about home that I usually look at in my practice. Yeah. And there is a really strong theme of home in a number of your works. You keep returning back to this, this point of origin almost. It really seems to drive your creative practice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say my, my entire practice is pinned on the experience of living in between spaces mm. and revisiting the farm because, and unless you've grown, grown up somewhere, it doesn't need to be a farm, but unless you've grown up somewhere quite distinctive and then lived somewhere completely different, you don't understand what it's like to revisit that place and still have access to that place but, but not live there permanently. It's quite a jarring thing. Um, but it's, you know, my life on the farm and my family's, uh, my family's still living there is something that's really valuable to me. Yeah. And it's just kind of the biggest thing that's happening in my life and I'm self-centred enough that I <laughs> decided that I kind of couldn't make my practice about that. And it did come to me quite late, um, discovering that that was what my core conceptual concerns were going to be. Mm. Um, but also more broadly, I'm looking at ideas around just sensations of living or being in between, um, which isn't exclusive to people who have lived rurally. It's something that's definitely, you know, that's just my experience. But one of my favourite things is to listen to people um, who have totally different experiences come and look at my work and, yeah. and tell me how they relate to it in very different, you know, backgrounds. Yeah. Do you think, you know, in the context of... What, where this work came from and, and what it sort of means to you that showing it first in Port Piri and now here has some kind of resonance with you to be able to show it to this regional communities? Oh, if, if I could pick anywhere to show this work, any art gallery at all, it would just be regional galleries as the top tier because I feel like people in regional galleries are going to get this work. Um, but also I would be interested to see this work in a metropolitan setting because I think that there would be people living in the city from rural areas that would see it and probably have a bit of a, you know, a bit of a moment of, oh, wow. Yeah, um, absolutely. But it, it means so much to me that it's shown in rural areas because I feel like people in Port Pirie and Mount Gambia and, you know, so, so many people are travelling nowadays. It is, yeah, they're special spaces for me to show the work. And I think, you know, the other thing that you talk about in the essay and um, sort of around this work is the title that it almost had. Yeah. So the title for the work was nearly called Look Out for Snakes because the work emerged when I was, I was actually developing a work for a different exhibition a couple of years ago at Felt Space. Um, and I started just filming the ground and thinking about how many of my friends say to me when we're walking along, why are you looking at the ground? Like, you look so intensely at the ground when you walk around. And um, so I started filming the ground after thinking about friends saying that to me. And the reason that I look really intensely at the ground when I walk around is because my dad has an absolute phobia of snakes and we live on a farm so that's pretty common with farmers um, 
So my dad would always say to us when we were kids, look, look around when, when you're walking and anyone in my family, like my brothers and my mum, and especially my dad, when he walks around, he is just like this, he's not looking <laughs> up at all. Um, but it's such an ingrained habit. And the result of that habit is this strange appreciation for ground surfaces, both inside and outside. Mm. Um, so I guess making the work was a way of playing into that um, appreciation for ground surfaces. And also because when you watch this clip, the, the ground surfaces at home and the, you know, in domestic and exterior are so distinctly different from mm. what's in Adelaide. And it's things that when I go home, I look at the, like the tiles from the sixties in the bathroom and I go, oh, and you know, the carpet and the lino and the rubble and salt bush and all that sort of stuff. And again, that's a common experience, even if you don't live in the country. If you go back to your mum and dad's house, you look at the tiles and it's like, oh. But yes, it was nearly called Look Out for Snakes <laughs> because of this strange behaviour that many friends have picked up on. Yeah, I like that. When I moved to Mount Gambier, I had a lot of people tell me, constantly warn me about snakes. And that was kind of a new experience for me as well, particularly, you know, going on hikes and stuff. It's like, watch out for snakes, watch out for snakes. It's that or watch out for kangaroos when you're driving. Those are the two yeah. kind of wildlife. Well, that was, when I was making the work, I was started going through in my head, like what other weird behaviors do I have that are from the farm? And one of them is that when I drive, I look straight ahead, but I'm also doing this all the time, side to side. And yeah. my partner, when we went back to the farm the first time, he commented on it. <laughs> He's like, what are you looking for? I was like, kangaroos. <laughs> I do, and it's not until you're with people who haven't grown up with those experiences that you identify them yourself. But um, I'm really interested in those strange yeah. ingrained perspectives that are different um, within different communities and different things that you grow up with. Because to me, that's all part of um, yeah, the experience of living at home and revisiting that. And when, yeah. you, when you take those experiences into the city where there aren't generally kangaroos jumping up from Anzac <laughs> Highway, there aren't generally snakes at Marion Shopping Centre. <laughs> but yet the behaviour persists. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and for me, it's happened um, in reverse. It's become learned behaviour for me. So I find myself saying to my city friends when they're driving here, when they're visiting or, you know, when they're thinking about driving at night, I'm always constantly warning them about kangaroos. And I hear myself saying it and I realise what that means about my experience here, you know? Yeah. I find that really interesting. That's such a lovely way for you to sort of acknowledge <laughs> and, and notice yourself how much a part of Mount Gambier and the community that you've become yeah. in your time <laughs> that you've spent here. Yeah, it's, um, you live anywhere long enough, yeah. The other thing I'm no, I was thinking about when you were talking is this idea of going home and when you're at home and these details are what triggers you to know that you're there. But there's also this generational history that's embedded in the material things of that house. So the tiles that are in the bathroom or the laundry. Yeah, both. Yeah, you know, that the history that that comes with it, that it was your, was it your grandmother yeah. who did those? So, so mum and dad live at the farm still, but my father's parents, my grandparents lived there until mum and dad got married. So they moved in, and I think in 1951, and the house had been abandoned before then. Yeah. Um, so they worked on the house a lot. So lots of the house has been put together by my grandma and her sister and that sort of thing. So it's this lovely kind of self-portrait of, of the family. It was intergenerational look at the family. But also that's why I was really interested in filming the exterior spaces because I'm always trying to consider my colonial history and obviously in South Australia we have you know so much work to do with or well, in all of Australia we have so much to do with acknowledging our own personal histories and our collective history so I made a I made an effort to look at surfaces you know this is a natural um, 
you know, this is stinging nettle. Mm. And, but I'm, I tried to look at weeds and grounds that hadn't been disturbed and grounds that were farming grounds mm. so that it was a way for viewers to consider, and I talk about this in, you know, the little interview that accompanies the work, a way to consider the impact that our colonial presence has had on the land because it has, you know, inarguably had an enormous impact on the mm. land um, and people. Um, and there, there is this lovely family history mm. that makes me feel very warm and lovely and cosy, but there's also quite a, a dark history of, you know, why my family are farmers. Mm. I'm really proud of the farm, but I'm not proud of the way that farming has happened in Australia. Mm. Um, and I think these kind of observational films are a good way to sit and consider how those uncomfortable feelings can sit alongside each other. Yeah, I think there's really powerful work to be done in acknowledging these complex histories and really considering what it means to look in the face of, of our past. And I think the resolution, I think people underestimate the value of the discussion and look for the resolution when in reality I think you know works like this where you're you can express both pride and concern that those two things can live side by side and in one yeah is really important it's difficult to make work um in that realm because I'm conscious that I'm never going to have I'm never going to get it right with those sorts of things. The only things I can do is to have discussions with people and listen to their perspective. And I was extremely privileged to have a discussion with an Aboriginal woman. I won't name her because I haven't asked her if it's okay to share this conversation and name her. Um, but she came and spoke to me while I was making this work and I was doing a residency in Port Pirie. And we had the most beautiful frank discussion it, it was just such a it was an hour-long talk it was two aboriginal ladies but one in particular was telling me about i was telling her about all my sort of conflicted feelings mm. around the work and she said to me you just need to stop worrying about this stuff and just make the work and you'll know if it's not right you'll know if it's not appropriate um and she said if you ever if you ever feel like you don't know what to film or you don't know what to make and you're feeling lost, go out to the farm and find your favourite tree and sit by your favourite tree. And so after that, I went home and found my favourite tree, sat by my favourite tree and had to think about her. But I'm conscious that, you know, I can't solve this massive issue that we have with, mm. you know, our colonial history. But I think not talking about it is a massive mistake mm. and it needs to be something that we actively discuss and, and acknowledge that it will feel uncomfortable but we need to have the discussions um, and acknowledging our work. Yeah, absolutely. I also just wanted to ask you a little bit about your choice of medium. Medium and scale, I think, and duration as well. I'm kind of fascinated by video work because of all of those concepts. It operates so differently in video as opposed to painting. And I just wanted to know why, you know, it's video that you chose to tell this story with. It's funny that you say that because I'm in the midst of um, unpacking that myself. Uh, I've always, once I decided that this, this whole experience of home and, and sort of living in limbo land was what I was going to look at with my work, it seems like nothing but video was going to be what I was going to be able to use. And I have tried to sort of, you know, whip up a few dodgy paintings and a few sculptural things, um, but they're so permanent. Mm. And the experiences and the sensations that I'm looking at are things that are happening. So when you're feeling homesick, you don't just feel homesick and nothing else. Or when you're feeling nostalgic, it's, it's kind of, it's a sensation and, and a feeling and, it's things that are happening um, and then they go and then they come back and then they go. Mm. And 
the nature of installation and moving image is that it's unstoppable. It just keeps going. Mm. And then you pack it up at the end of an exhibition and that's it, it's just gone. <laughs> and that's kind of how I feel about going back to the farm. I sort of go back to the farm and I have all these feelings and, and I go back to Adelaide and have all these feelings on the drive home and, and then I get back home and it's, it's packed away. You know, I can't, you can't go back there until you make the big effort and go back there and make the trip. Mm. Um, and that's kind of how the nature of my work exists. It doesn't exist and, unless you've made this big effort to do it and it's mm. only ever temporary. Yeah. Um, I don't think I could handle ex expressing these ideas in really permanent states like painting. I'm not actually a very good painter, so, <laughs> so skill set aside. Um, but I do, I really love sculpture and some aspects of painting. Um, and I really love drawing. Um, and there have been sculptural elements to my installation, but always on an ephemeral basis. Mm. It's always um, temporary. And usually the sculptural elements are something that degrade over time or change over time. Like um, my recent exhibition at Salvia House was um, putting smells on walls. And it, it was these sort of scents and they were in, um, in this sort of, it was kind of like a Vaseline medium. So that so they degraded over the exhibition, but they also just had to be wiped off at the end. You can't you can't buy a, a smear of smell from a wall. <laughs> um, so again, I only feel comfortable looking at these things in an ephemeral way because my work is about um, feelings and sensations that change and move and evolve. Yeah. Cyclical. Yeah. Yeah. A big, it's a big way of saying I can't paint. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, it is really, it's really meditative and it's really immersive in a way that I think a painting doesn't necessarily do or you have to paint at such a scale that it's almost prohibitive to afford or move or, or store. So, you know, there's a lot of sort of elements here that are working to your favour, to be able to tour it around, to show it to these regional galleries, but also when the feeling is not with you to pack it away and not yeah. look at it, which I think, you know, it's underestimated as a, when you're having these intense feelings, particularly of homesickness, it, you're right, it doesn't, it's not a continuous high level emotion 24 seven, it is something that kind of wax and wa waxes and wanes. And I think that matching of the, the medium with the sensation is really not something I'd considered before, but I love it. Yeah, it's something that I hate the word intuitively because it's overused, but it's something that I intuitively <laughs> felt when I was, um, when I started, you know, fleshing out some of these ideas. Um, and then when I started really challenging myself as to why I was just making um, moving image works and soundscapes and make a lot of soundscapes. I haven't exhibited many of them. Um, but I had to figure out what, what was in common with that kind of temporary thing. Mm. But also scale. I'm very sceptical of this, you know, make a nice shiny video and project it at a massive size kind of trap. And I make a conscious effort to only make works for spaces. Um, and I knew in the Port Pirie Regional Art Gallery that I would have the opportunity to throw the work at a massive scale, um, which is why I revisited this work that I had started making and kind of put in the bank. Mm. And the reason I had put this work to the side when I originally started making it was because I was making work for an exhibition at Felt Space and it was the wrong space to make work. It was the wrong room, wrong scale. Um, claustrophobic in that time. Yeah, space. and it was I was making a intentionally claustrophobic work um, that just wouldn't have suited these kind of ideas at all. Mm. So this is you know that large scale immersive kind of you know Pipilotti wrist does it brilliantly mm. um, in yeah. so much of her works. But she is a great example because she also has all of these whack kind of smaller scale things that are just brilliant. Yeah. So she's not just relying on those devices of having a great camera and having a great projector and being able to shoot anything big. Yeah. It's kind of like using a really good glaze in every painting and, for, and putting everything against a black wall, like any painting's gonna look good. Yeah. Um, 
So I'm conscious of those kind of things. But also all of this was shot with a macro lens. All of this was shoot, shot up close and that was why I wanted to project it really big because we're confronting these surfaces in a way that we're not going to, you know, no one puts their face down to the ground and looks at, <laughs> looks at the, um, the grain in the wood or looks at your, you know, diesel on weeds yeah. <laughs> or, or whatnot. Yeah. Um, so that was a great using the macro lens made me think this would be amazing really in a big immersive way that we wouldn't normally appreciate those services. Yeah. Well, I think it works and thanks. I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's one word, but uh, <laughs> I'm really excited actually for everyone to come on down and spend some time with this work sit with it, sit in it almost and just enjoy that sensation of looking closely and slowly at something over time as a break from the intensity that is our lives at the moment. I think this is a nice break from that. So, And you have provided a beautiful couch for everyone to sit on. So thank you for that <laughs> because it's so nice to have a space that you can actually sit down and look at a work and get off your feet, off your heels or off whatever that's right to go and see it so thank you for providing such an immaculate gallery space <laughs> to be able to look at the work and yeah our pleasure well i think we'll wrap up there and thank you so much georgia for coming to mount gambia for installing this work and having a chat to us tonight thank you and for those of you who want to come and see the exhibition it'll be open from tomorrow at 10 a.m